Hey y'all, welcome back to the podcast. So if you listened to last week's episode, you know that we're talking about relationships, we're talking about dating, we're talking about all the things when it comes to love and whatever is in that realm. So last week we talked about dating well and what that entailed. And this week we'll be diving into what it looks like to wait well. And I think a lot of times we like to talk about dating and tips and tricks and all that, but we never talk about what the waiting season looks like. So before I jump into that, I did want to read um, a feedback I had about last week's episode, which is really cool. Like if you ever have any feedback, anything funny that you took from that episode, um, just text me if you have my number or Instagram message me or send me a message on YouTube, whatever it is. But Uh, A friend of mine messaged me, and I won't say her name because I'm not going to incriminate her, but she said, um, you know, we're going back and forth about, you know, relationships and dating and um, what another title could be is Do Not Chase the Little Mama, or another title could be How to Weed Through Dusty Men. And, you know, we're just being facetious here. We're being funny, um, joking about relationships and what that looks like and all that. But yeah, if you ever have any comments about any of my episodes, whether it's good or bad, if you're critiquing it, I don't care. I'll take it and weed through the critique. But it's really cool. I love hearing people's feedback and what they think and, you know, their thoughts, their experience in relationships and dating. Anyways, so today's episode, we'll be talking about waiting well, what that looks like. Um, And, you know, that could be simply navigating through the ups and downs of being in a relationship and what that timeline looks like. Uh, It could be um, finding patience, maintaining a healthy mindset while you wait and you're not in a relationship, um, waiting for a commitment, waiting for the right partner. So that's that's what we're going to be juggling through today in this episode. But before I go into that episode, I wanted to share a little story. So um, this week I, or this past weekend, I made uh, chili and, you know, I was starving. Chili was hot. I took out my bowl and my husband's bowl and I couldn't wait because I was starving. And I, you know, whenever you get to that point where you're hangry, it doesn't really matter how hot the food is. It doesn't really matter the temperature. At that point, it's just give me food, just quench that thirst thirst, quench that hunger or satisfy that hunger. So I took a bite of the chili and obviously what happens when you bite into hot food or consume hot food, you burn your tongue. And well, every bite after that was, it was like, I'm already in this, so I'm just going to be burnt for the rest of the day. And well, the rest of the week for that matter. So the same thing is if you like, for instance, you're starving, you haven't had pizza in about nine, 10 months or a year, whatever. The pizza arrives, it's hot, it's in the box. You can smell the pizza. It looks good when you open it up. It's everything you ever wanted. It has all the toppings. Steam you can see is coming from the pizza. You take a bite, the cheese burns your tongue, maybe even burns your lip, burns your mouth. But you take a bite anyways, and you keep doing that, and it gets worse and worse, and you diminish the quality and enjoyment of your pizza experience or pizza eating experience because you've already ruined your mouth from going too fast and eating too fast or eating when the food wasn't ready. So you'll know if you ever cook or if you eat, which you probably do eat, eating is very good for you that whenever the food is fresh out of the oven, whether it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, or you're just making something, you wait a little bit before you try it. You wait a little bit before you eat it. And that waiting game can be very tumultuous, especially if you are starving, especially if you've gotten to the point of hunger. But I say this analogy because trying to be patient is difficult. It's not easy especially when you're hungry, especially if it's something that you desire, especially if it's something that you've been waiting for a very long time. For instance, I went back home to my home country, Belize, um, with my husband, I think it's three months now. 
And when I went back home, all I wanted to do other than see my home, you know, visit family, uh, show Jared around. One of the major things was I wanted to try all the foods that were not accessible here in the U.S. And I did. And I had to be patient. Even up to the day we left, I kept saying over and over, I can't wait. I can't wait to be there. But that patience pays off when we do the waiting. And, you know, that comes with relationship, that comes with food, that comes with anything in life. In order to get to that destination, in order to get to the prize, waiting is involved. It's not passive. It's while you're waiting, you are buying tickets, you are planning things out, you're, you're creating your agenda. While you are waiting, you're maybe cleaning your dishes, you are, you know, um, tidying it up before the food has cooled off. While you are waiting, you're bettering yourself, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think you get the point, you get where I'm going here. So let's talk about the art of waiting well. Essentially, embracing the journey. And I think I mentioned that last time in dating. Well, you know, it's, it's a journey that you're embarking on and you're, you're, you're doing that with someone that you're choosing to pursue. In this case, it's a journey that you're embarking on fixating solely on rather than fixating solely on a destination, you are fixating on self-awareness, emotional resist, uh, resilience, and the purpose behind your waiting period. And patience is a cruel or crucial role. It's very crucial. And you cannot get to that destination, which it shouldn't be. That shouldn't be your ultimatum, which it, for most people it is. Um, you have to utilize that time between where you are now to the person that you hope to marry or hope to find someday to better yourself. The focus shouldn't be getting to that end point. The focus is that in between. What are you doing while you're waiting? What are you doing to better yourself? What are you doing on this journey of singleness? So before we go into all the different topics that I want to talk about or the, the, the touch points I want to talk about in this specific episode, I do want to mention Romans 8, 25, where it says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So that is what dating is like. We're hoping for something we do not see. For a lot of you who are maybe in your 30s, hoping may seem pointless. It may seem um, maybe even ridicule or not ridicule, um, ludicrous to hope for something that you personally cannot envision. But when we wait for it with patience, that's when we see development in our character. That's when we see development in our walk, not just with Christ, but in our personal journey of self-development. Another verse or uh, an entire passage I wanted to touch on is Psalm 27. And it's a beautiful Psalm. I do encourage you to read it, whether you are a believer or not. It's very encouraging. But the last part of the Psalm, it says, um, verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies, which your enemy is not, not dating. Um, your enemy could be even your own self, forcing yourself to date or that desire to date um, is more so out of wanting uh, your needs being fulfilled. Uh, deliver me not from onto the will of my enemies for false witness are risen against me and such as breathe out cruelty. I have fainted unless I have believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord, waiting on his timing, waiting on the person that he has for you is crucial in the journey of singlehood. And while my journey of singlehood wasn't necessarily the longest, I did have a period of my time where I had to wait and it was crucial that I depended on the Lord. Otherwise, I would have been swayed left and right with whichever guy that popped up, whichever guy gave me attention. And that's not what I wanted to do. I know exactly what I wanted. I knew exactly where I wanted to be. I knew exactly where the Lord was calling me to be. And I said, you know what, Lord, I will submit this part of my heart to you. And when the timing is right, I know you're going to give me all the answers. You're going to make it very clear to me that this is the guy I should pursue. So 
The first thing I wanted to touch on on this topic is the power of self-discovery. Um, if you don't know who you are, there's no point for or no reason for you to be dating or to even be on the dating scene. If you question your purpose, you question um, your identity, you question what your goal is in this world, there's no reason for you to add someone else because that's just a ton of baggage that you're going to push, push on that person and put on them. I emphasize heavily to figure out who you are, figure out the, 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 the path that you are to take. If you're a believer, seek the Lord and ask, even if you're not a believer, you know, seek the Lord, ask him, you know, who am I? Show me who I am. Show me who I'm supposed to be. And in that exploration, you'll find out what your desires are, your values are, your aspirations. You'll develop hobbies, interests, your goals. Like all these different things are important as you wait. That self-discovery, what you're passionate about, try new things, um, enter into different groups. Those that is extremely important before you start dating. As you're waiting, you need to figure out you. You need to figure out who you are. You need to figure out what your purpose is in life. And it may not be this grand, big, you know, boom voice from the Lord saying, you are called to this. It may be just subtle things where you realize, oh, I'm talented in this area. Oh, I really enjoy doing this. Maybe I should explore this a little bit more. So, Biggest tidbit here, the power of self-discovery. It's it's so stinking powerful because it creates not just an attractive side of you. I, I mean, if you're a girl listening to this, a guy really likes, I won't say love because they should not love at first sight. Um, even though my husband said he knew I was going to be his wife the first time he saw me. But that's a story for another time. I'm sure he would love to tell his version of how we met and how we fell in love. But a guy loves, a good guy, a guy that has his crap figured out, he will be attracted to a woman who knows who they are, who is confident, who has their crap figured out, who knows their purpose, who is well-rounded. That is attractive. Beyond your physical features, if you are confident in who you are, if you are strutting your stuff, not to get attention, but because you genuinely know, you know, this is who I am. This is who God has created me to be. That is attractive. Guys look at that and they're like, that, that's what I want. She's who I want. She's got it together. And it also creates somewhat of a competitive nature in guys too, where they're like, well, maybe I should figure out my crap. Maybe I should, you know, I need to be a little bit better. I, if, I, if, I, if I have to do a couple of things different in order to impress this girl, I'll do it because she's worth it. So self-discovery, extremely important. Do it. Do not you know, take the another step before figuring that part out, because that is that is the foundation that's fundamental in order for you to find someone that is not only compatible, but someone that will, you know, be with you in the long run. Another thing I wanted to touch on is communication and expectations. Again, communication we talked about in this this in the last episode It's important to talk about it now while you are waiting it is healthy to involve yourself in healthy communication and managing expectations. What I mean by that, if you're waiting, you're obviously not in a relationship unless you are in a relationship and you're dating and you're, you know, waiting to get engaged. But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about here is you are single. You're a single Pringle. You're not talking to anyone. How do you develop or cultivate communication and expectations if you're not talking to anyone? You develop that by talking to your parents. If you have siblings, talking to your siblings. If you work, which I hope you're working, you cultivate that in your work atmosphere. Building those traits, learning how to uh, properly communicate and express your expectations is important because what you do in the workplace, what you do with your family, what you do in the church, what you do in your friend group is what you're going to carry with you in your dating relationship. If you already shy away from confrontation, if you shy away from 
expressing what you expect or would want or need, then you're going to carry that into relationship. This also, I would say, tie into that self um, discovery, but it, it's, it's a quality and a trait that you need to have in a relationship. Otherwise, you're going to suffer, especially if it's a guy that's very dominant. They're going to take advantage of you. Um, whether indirectly or directly, whether intentionally or unintentionally, they will end up taking advantage of you because you were silent. You're not uh, expressive enough to communicate and assert yourself when, ass when that assertiveness is necessary. Another thing I wanted to touch on is cultivating resilience. So resilience is extremely important while you are waiting, building emotional resilience. Um, you know, it involves com self compassion, um, embracing uncertainty, mindfulness te techniques, seeking support from friends, family, professionals. If that's in your church place, in your, your Christian community. It's, you know, you got to remember that waiting well means acknowledging your feelings without letting them consume you and finding healthy ways to cope. That's the resilience part of it. Because when you are dating, when you do end up in a relationship, because I will prophesy that for you who are wanting a relationship, who you've been waiting and you're saying, I've been waiting for years now and that guy hasn't showed up, that girl hasn't showed up. You know what? We're just going to believe that they will. But in your waiting season, that resilience needs to be built because there will be times where you have to pick up your stuff and fight where you have to find that strength in you to keep going because relationships are messy. They get ugly. Sometimes you deal with things that you don't, you know, you didn't necessarily sign up for, but it's important. Create those habits, journaling, journaling, finding friends, uh, your support system, even building techniques within yourself where you are able to fight when things happen, you know, and, and that for a Christian that comes with prayer, that comes with fighting through prayer, fighting through praise. And whenever trials of many kinds comes, you realize, you know, that builds patience, that builds character, but all of that is built solely on your dependence on Christ. So resilience is important. Another thing I wanted to mention is recognizing red flags. Now, I did this in my relationship or before I ended up uh, in a relationship. I recognized red flags by interviewing, but not interviewing my friends. And I learned the things that they realized after the fact. And, you know, they, most of them all or most of them have really great relationships. Um, you know, some of them don't and that's understandable. You go through hard times and, you know, they're working through their stuff and that that's normal. But I learned from my family and friends mistakes. And that's the good part of being the last one to get married. Not saying that my marriage is perfect by any means. We have our moments. We have our things that we struggle with. We have, you know, things that we need to um, or ways we need to develop it personally on our own journey and as a couple but for the most part we have a pretty phenomenal marriage I would I'm not complaining I love my husband I know he loves me and life is really really sweet but learn those red flags from your friends your family learn from their mistakes ask them what are things that were critical or you know unhealthy dynamics that you realize after the fact that you would advise me to look out for and I was very honest with them I was like hey I'm not dating right now but I just need to know like what did you did wrong and they were honest with me and a good friend will be honest with you a good family member whoever loves you will be honest with you and let you know hey these are the signs you should look out for these are the things you should stay away from these are the character traits the the personality that you should you know maybe not get yourself involved with because it may rub your personality in a wrong way especially if they, that person knows you if your mentor your I mean your mom if if you have a mom or a dad they will know you the best or your siblings like my siblings if I could have had them as my bride bridesmaids I would um, but my all my all my siblings are boys they're brother my brothers but they're my best friends and they know me through and through and they would have known had I picked someone that 
was contrary to my character in the sense of like super outlandish uh, or very, um, what you call it, or unequally yoked. They would have called it out and be like, Vashti, this is not going to work out. I'm going to tell you right now, this, it, this will fail. And I would have accepted that because it's my brothers and they know me well. And I may not have accepted it in the right way, but I would have eventually accepted it. So those are the major things that I wanted to hash out and talk about in terms of waiting well. And we can recap on that. The power of self-discovery, communication um, and expectations, learning how to communicate your expectations and just communicate in general before you enter a relationship, learning the skill of listening, uh, cultivating, cultivating resilience, recognizing red flags, and lastly, moving forward with purpose. So what does it mean by moving forward with purpose? Waiting well is nurturing yourself. And I think it's like full circle again, your growth in your relationships, embracing the uncertainty, seizing the opportunities for self-discovery, you know, approach every phase of life um, with intentionality and remembering that, you know, it starts with a strong foundation. We talk about what that strong foundation is. That is your self-discovery. Waiting well is a powerful way to create that foundation, no matter the outcome, no matter if you don't end up with someone, you are bettering yourself. You're becoming a better version of you because you're putting you first, putting Christ first, but then putting you first. You is important. A lot of the times what we do is we focus on the outward appearance. Yes, working out is important. Yes, being physically attractive is important. But if inside you are rotten to the core, No one's going to like you. If you have a stinky attitude, if all you do is gossip, if you criticize, if you, you know, and I'm not saying you have to be perfect. We all have our flaws, but work on yourself. You know, the things that you need to work on. You've probably been called out on it several times. Work on those things. Become a better version of you before you even enter into a relationship. So now let's talk about tips. We're going to talk about 12 tips in order to wait well. And those 12 tips are first, uh, focus on yourself. And I mentioned that, and I think I'll continue to mention that over and over and over. Focus on yourself. There's no reason for you to be looking left and right, looking what that other person is doing or what, you know, your other friend's doing and, oh, they're in a relationship and, you know, they've only waited five years. Who gives a crap? Sorry. That's very crass, but who gives a crap? You are on your own journey. You are on your own race. You are on your own path that the Lord has put you on. Focus on that. If you, for instance, if you were driving and you were solely focused on the person in the left lane, you're probably going to crash. You're probably going to end up in an accident. So if you don't do that while you're driving, if you're focused on what's ahead of you and you keep moving, you're not in a passive mindset, but you are aggressive in where you are, you're driving safely, you keep moving forward. That's what you should do in life too, especially in dating, especially as you're waiting. Keep moving forward. Keep focusing on the path that the Lord has placed you on. Don't look left or right because you'll end up hurting yourself and hurting those around you. Another one is um, set clear intentions. Even before you are in a dating relationship, Write down those clear intentions that you want. Determine what you're looking for in a relationship, the values, what priorities you have. That even when a guy gives you the time of day and you notice, "Mm, well, doesn't line up with my values or politically he's we're we're going to clash or, you know, he believes this and I believe that not saying you're going to believe every single thing the same, but the fundamental things, the the deal breakers, those have to line up. Otherwise, you're going to constantly clash in your relationship. So set clear intentions. I had a notes of all the things that I was looking for in a man. All the things that I was praying for in a man and one of the things that I had up, had on my list, which seemed very superficial, was God, I want him twice the size of me. I want him really tall. I've prayed for a tall man. And the Lord gave me just that because if you know my husband, you know the height difference. It's pretty comical, but I love it. I love that I can um, have someone that can protect and shield me physically, emotionally, spiritually, 
Um, but yeah, so set those intentions, very clear intentions. Don't beat around the bush. Be very specific. Cultivate. I don't like the whole self-love, but self-love is important. Um, self-love, I think, is a little bit more on the carefree side of things. But for this episode, we will say cultivate self-love. Why? You have to love yourself. You can't wait on someone else to love you in order for you to figure out that you're worth loving or being loved. You have to love you. You have to look in the mirror and tell yourself, um, what's that movie called? It's a phenomenal movie. I love all the actresses in there. But, you know, you is kind, you is smart, you is beautiful. Whatever it is that you know you struggle to believe is true about yourself. Speak those things over your life. Say you love yourself because you have to love you. And that's not being uh, conceited or weird. I love me. And it took me a while to get to the place where I realized I was worth loving. And when I found out that I was worth loving, that like that that spurred confidence that spurred attractiveness and outward attractiveness that when Jared walked by and he was in line and he saw me he was like oh okay she's the one anyways cultivate self-love love you you is important you are worth it you are absolutely worth it and don't wait for someone to convince you that you are you may have had a rough upbringing where, you know, you weren't reminded of how loved you are, how important you are. Don't allow the past to drag you down. At some point, that has an expiration date and you can't use that as an excuse anymore. I'm sorry. Um, you, you just can't. You have to at some point get over and that sounds harsh. And, you know, we all have our own past and our own baggage and the things that we are that, that shaped who we are today. But you and I ultimately have a choice. We choose what we believe. We choose the, 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 the mindset that we have. So cultivate self-love. You are important. And yeah. Oh, The Help. That's what it is. That's the book. It just dawned on me. Um, the Help. You is kind. You is important. Love that movie. Love the book. Super great. All the actresses. Phenomenal. The score, side note, in that movie is chef's kiss. The score is beautiful. But anyways, again, another time for that. Or was it the help? It might have been um, another one where the score is really beautiful. Same, I think, similar actresses in that one too. But anyways, I have digressed. Another tip is expand your, cir your social circles. This one is really important. Go beyond what you're normally used to. Go to different, if you're a Christian, it, it, go to different young adults groups. Go to different activities. Put yourself out there, not like a peacock, flaunting your singleness and saying, Lord, someone marry me up. That's, what, that's not what you're doing. Um, what you're doing is you're expanding your realm of influence. You're expanding your realm of being influenced by, and, you know, be careful, place yourself in positions that are right. Don't, don't put yourself out there in, in communities that, you know, are against their morals and beliefs. Cause you'll find someone that believes and has morals that are contrary to what you believe in. So just be very careful with that one, but do expand and push, put yourself out there. It can be difficult, especially if you're an introvert, and it can be overwhelming if it is, if you're an introvert and that, you know, intimidates you or give you anxiety, ask a friend, even a married friend. Hey, I want to go to this event. Can you come along with me um, and put yourself out there? Be brave. You're, you're not going to find someone if you stick in the same circle. Um, you, you have to expand yourself, explore the world, do something different, try something new, and you'll eventually meet someone new. So practice mindfulness. Mindfulness can help you manage your feelings, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. This is a secular concept. I say practice prayer, practice uh, meditation in Christ, practice quietness in, in Christ. 
in practicing and quieting yourself, you have moments of self-discovery. You have moments where you realize areas that you need to grow in. You are more likely to pinpoint areas that require a lot of work. And that's where the Lord moves the most is when we're quiet and when we still our hearts, we ready our hearts and we say, Lord, here I am. So this one's more on from a biblical standpoint and it, and, and it is fundamental in waiting. You can't do it. I mean, you can if you want to, but if you're a believer and you, you, you're praying for that significant other, you can't do it without the Lord. You have to do it with him and you want to do it with him. Otherwise, you're going to find someone that will hurt you and you, you break your heart. Uh, we talked about communicate your intentions. Again, emphasizing that as well. Write that down. Have your list. That's number seven. Number eight, build a support system. This is important. Have your people, have your tribe that you go to, have your people that will pray for you, that will, you know, be with you when you are very lonely, that you can call on and be like, hey, another friend of mine got engaged. I'm happy for them, but it's I'm just really bummed out right now. Have your people that you can call. One of my dearest friends we met in college and we are I think we're friends now for about nine or 10 years. I'm not sure. But she's my confidant. She's the person that I can vent to. We'll go on walks. I won't say once a week, but we try to go on walks pretty often. And we'll just walk. Um, this Recently, we walked, I think, four and a half miles. And we just talked. And I, I, I know I can share my heart with her. I know I can be, confi- um, I can be confident in her honesty, in her ability to, you know, keep, not keep a secret, but I don't know the, real, the phrase that I'm looking for, but I can trust her. I can trust that, you know, whatever is said is between her and I. And, you know, we pray about it. We, we vent to each other. We laugh together. We joke together. But have your support system. I have mentors that I talk to whenever I'm going through issues that are critical to my character and spiritual walk. Um, my support system is now my husband, my mom. I love my mom. I can call her about anything. But have the people that you call or are a part of your tribe and don't let it don't ever let them go because they are important they are the people that you will fall back on and don't neglect them whenever you do enter enter into a relationship I see a lot of times when people fall in love and they enter into a relationship it's like peace out found my man found my girl I could care less about everyone else don't do that because it what are the odds it doesn't work out those are the same people you're going to fall back on So that's a side note. Build your support system. Number nine, learn from past experiences, especially if you have dated before, learn from past experiences. Don't open up too quickly. Don't give yourself or too much of yourself too quickly. Pray if you didn't pray before. Um, Learn from the past experiences, those red flags that you saw in the past and glean from them. They say, Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me, tw- fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So if your second relationship ends in, you know, muddy waters and it's not because of something brand new, but it's because it's a pattern, a, a pattern of relationships that you keep getting into, then the shame is on you, honey. It's no longer on the guy because you keep picking, you keep picking the same guy over and over. You have to, at some point, Admit that your past experiences have shaped your future ones and you need to learn from them. Pick those things that you need to learn from and run away in the future whenever you see those same type of character traits or red flags. Stay positive. I think I mentioned this in the last episode. I hate the term positive vibes, positive attitude, which, you know, being positive is great. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's such a culture you know, 20, I don't want to say, I don't even say 21st century saying, but it's, I don't know. It's such, it's it's a phrase that just really rubs me the wrong way. But for the sake of this episode, we will say, stay positive. You have to stay positive or the Christian way to say it, which I don't like to over spiritualize and Christianize everything, but stay hopeful. It, It can be hard, especially when everyone else is in a relationship to be hopeful, to be happy for other people, but do your best to do that. Be happy, rejoice when other people are rejoicing. 
cry when other people are crying, um, but be there for those people and just stay hopeful while you are waiting. And that is difficult. It's easier said than done. But I, you know, I remember, and I talked about this maybe a, a season or two ago, you know, all my friends are dating. What now? All my friends are married. What now? All my friends are having children. What now? And it's always that what now someone will always be moving ahead of you or be, uh, or someone will always be one step, maybe two steps ahead of you. Don't fall into that pressure that you have to be at a certain phase of life because everyone else is there or the majority of your friend group is there. You are on your own journey. You are on your, your own path. Be hopeful in where the Lord has placed you. Because if you keep looking at the next big, big thing, you're going to miss what God's doing right in front of you. You're, you might even miss your spouse because you're looking far ahead and you're looking at what other people have and what they're doing. Don't fall into that trap. Be hopeful or stay positive as the new generation um, has been loosely saying. So another thing, avoid comparisons. And I touched on that just now. Um, you are on a different path. You're on a different journey. Don't compare where you are with someone else. And that, again, is easier said than done, especially if you're someone that has a major checklist and you had a goal and a plan for what your life would look like. Your life is different. Avoid comparing yourself with someone else. If you are comparing yourself yourself with someone else that you'd like to be, find those character traits, find th that thing that that person is doing, and then use that to motivate you to become a better person. That's the best way to use comparison. But if you are using comparison to drag you down and put you in a hole and have you in this um, rut, then that's, that's the worst thing you can do with comparison. Whenever I find myself comparing myself with someone else, I pause and I say, wait, why am I doing this? Is it because I'm insecure? Or is there something in this individual that I can learn from that I can use to better myself? And more often than not, I, I do the I, I, I use whatever it is that person has or is doing and motivate that or motivate, motivate me to become a better version of myself. So huge tip there. Avoid comparing yourself. It's, it, it's only going to make you rotten from the inside out. And then um, lastly, seek help. And, you know, your help should come from the Lord. If you're a believer, seek the Lord. I would say that's the biggest thing I can leave with you is seek God through the process. I had a journal um, that I wrote letters to my husband and I prayed about him. I prayed for him. Um, and I started that maybe when I was 15 or 16. And then when I was 20, I start, started another book by Robin Jones Gunn. I'll probably put the book in the link, but it again talks about praying for your future husband or if I think it's your future spouse or future husband. But I use that as well to pray for my spouse and I submitted a really having a relationship to the Lord. Granted, I always thought, I would never get married. I thought I would be 28, 29, adopting a kid, um, moving to a different country and just having an entire adoption center and taking care of millions of kids because I love children. I, I, uh, children are so pure and precious that the Lord from a very young age placed in my heart just that desire to be a mom. But I just never thought I would ever get married. I wasn't looking. Um, I had the desire, but I genuinely wasn't looking at every guy that came around or, you know, presented themselves um, very Pride and Prejudice-esque, but and not present themselves, but any guy that even acknowledged that they had feelings for me, it has nothing to do with their worth, but they, I just they just weren't it. So I just thought, I was like, well, I guess I'm never going to get married because the guys that I do think are you know, cool or attractive or in line with my belief system, they're already dating, they're already married, or, um, you know, they're clearly not looking right now. So I just thought I would never get married. But while I was waiting, even though that thought was behind at the back of my head, I submitted that desire to the Lord. And I used that book, I think it's more like a journal book kind of thing to help me work on myself and also pray for my spouse in the process. So that's all I have for y'all today. 
a lot. I know I dished out quite a bit, but I hope for those of you who are waiting, for those of you who are desiring to be in a relationship and it feels like it's taking forever and a day, I want to encourage you to don't quit waiting. Don't settle and submit that to Jesus. And we talked about, you know, the biggest thing is work on you, work on knowing yourself, work on knowing your worth, work on loving who you are. Because if you don't figure out you and figuring out you requires a relationship with the Lord, you can't know you without knowing the creator, the person that created you. If you don't figure out who you are, then you're going to enter into a relationship broken and you're going to want that person to fulfill that void in your heart. And that's not their responsibility. I hate to break it to you. Their responsibility is not to make you feel secure. Their responsibility is not to make you feel confident in yourself. Now, there will be moments where you have, you know, insecurities that come up. Maybe, you know, you're newly married and you gain a little bit of weight. Your spouse is there to be like, hey, I still love you. It's fine. We're good. Let's work on this. But I'm talking about you as a single woman or a single guy. Know who you are. And the only way you can do that, the only way you can figure that part out is knowing your creator. But don't give up on waiting. Don't settle. Don't give up just yet. The Lord has someone for you. And it may take 50 years. It may take five years. It may take 10 years. I don't know what that timeline looks like. But work on you. Don't delay that process because who knows? The delay in your spouse may be because you are delaying figuring out who you are. You are delaying self-improvement. You are delaying cultivating a fundamental or the foundation of your life before that relationship comes up. So that's all I have for you guys today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share this podcast, this episode with a friend. And yeah, leave me a comment. Let me know your feedback. Text me anything that you think is vital to talk about on all the things. Um, Follow me on Instagram, whatever it is. But yeah, I love y'all and I'll see y'all next time.